So I'm just going to talk about three different poets that were from the like uh, 16th and 17th centuries in England. The first one's going to be Philip Sidney, who lived a really interesting life. He traveled a lot when he was young, and then uh, he died when he was 31 after fighting in the Netherlands. But he wrote a sonnet sequence called Astrophil and Stella, and uh, the name's kind of interesting because uh, Astrophil, if you take the Greek, Astro is star and Phil is love. So, star lover and Stella is a star also, Latin. And also, of course, his name was Phil, Philip. <laughs> he was the star lover. But this is the first sonnet in the sequence. And I think it's just really interesting as far as like an exposition on why people write at all. But uh, here it is. Loving in truth and fain in verse my love to show that she, dear she, might take some pleasure of my pain. Pleasure might cause her read, reading might make her know. Knowledge might pity win and pity grace obtain. I sought fit words to paint the blackest face of woe, studying inventions fine, her wits to entertain, oft turning others' leaves to see if thence would flow some French, some fresh and fruitful showers upon my sunburnt brain. But words came halting forth, wanting invention's stay. Invention nature's child fled step dame studies blows and others' feet still seemed but strangers in my way. Thus great with child to speak, and helpless in my throes, biting my truant pen, beating myself for spite. Fool, said my muse to me, look in thy heart and write. It just, especially that last line, because um, I've noticed, especially in like modernist books, um, just a couple random examples, like uh, there's this guy who wrote for Ulipo, Jacques Rubaud, Rubaud, I don't know how you say it. Uh, the Great Fire of London is his most famous work, which I didn't read, but he talked about how he tried to write a really complex book called The Great Fire of London, but he couldn't write it. So he wrote a book about writing the book called The Great Fire of London, and it's also titled The Great Fire of London, that's what he published. And like, um, there are other examples of this, like uh, George Saunders, Apparently wrote a book called La Boda de Eduardo, <laughs> which, which was like apparently a 700 page book that was inspired by Ulysses. And he talks about how he showed it to his wife and like after 10 minutes of reading it, she had her head like in her hands and he knew it was bad. So then he switched to writing like fun little short stories or whatever. And, um, like, uh, Samuel Beckett wrote A Dream of Fair to Middling Women, which he wrote was a collection of all of his thoughts at that time, but of course he never published it. I think maybe he was dead or it was just when he was very old, but, uh, I just think it's interesting how much, like, work people spend on their first books and sometimes even end up just not writing them that way or deciding they're bad and then writing something else that's generally easier or I don't know easier but or whatever but uh, then the second poet I want to read is Andrew Marvel the mower's song which is pretty famous I think but 
I think all these are probably pretty famous. But uh, I like them, so. This is the Mower song. I don't really know much about Andrew Marvel, but I knew he was friends with John Milton. And he, seem, he seems like a pretty funny guy because um, his poem to his coy mistress was... It's pretty funny. I remember reading it in my English class in college, and I think I was the only one that was laughing <laughs> whenever the teacher read it out loud. But that probably it. I think I seemed weird in that moment. But anyway, here's the mower song. My mind was once the true survey of all these meadows, fresh and gay, and in the greenness of the grass did see its hopes as in a glass. When Juliana came, and she, what I do to the grass, does to my thoughts in me. But these, while I with sorrow pine, grew more luxuriant still and fine, that not one blade of grass you spied, but had a flower on either side. When Juliana came, and she, what I do to the grass, does to my thoughts and me. Unthinkful meadows, could you so a fellowship so true forego, and in your gaudy May games meet, while I lay trodden under feet. When Juliana came and she, what I do to the grass, does to my thoughts and me. But what you in compassion ought, shall now by my revenge be wrought, and flowers and grass and I and all, will in one common ruin fall. For Juliana comes, and she, what I do to the grass, does to my thoughts and me. And thus, ye meadows which have been companions of my thoughts more green, shall now the heraldry become, for which I will adorn my tomb. For Juliana comes, and she, what I do to the grass, does to my thoughts and me. I don't really have anything to say about that poem, but I just enjoy it. And he has more mower poems, and they're just good. And then I'll um, read a couple by uh, Margaret Cavendish, who I hadn't heard about until I read this anthology, which is the, the New Oxford Book of 17th Century Verse. And I was just reading it, and uh, I got to Margaret Cavendish, and I discovered she wrote like an autobiography she wrote natural philosophy stuff and then wrote some poems and she was the first woman uh, inducted into the the royal society in london you know like where newton was and all these other guys robert hook all these famous scientists but i'll read two of her poems one is called Imagination. I language want to dress my fancies in. The hairs uncurled, the garments loose and thin. Had they but silver lace to make them gay, would be more corded than in poor array. Or had they art, might make a better show. But they are plain, yet cleanly do they go. The world in bravery doth take delight and glistering shows do more attract the sight. And every one doth honor a rich hood, as if the outside made the inside good. And every one doth bow and give the place, not for the man's sake, but for the silver lace. Let me entreat in my poor book's behalf that all may not adore the golden calf. Consider, pray, gold hath no life therein, and life in nature is the richest thing. So fancy is the soul in poetry, and if not good, a poem ill must be. Be just, let fancy have the upper place, and then my verses may perchance find grace. If flattering language all the passions rule, then sense I fear will be a mere dull fool. And then uh, the other poem I want to read is called Of Many Worlds in This World, which I don't know if she just got lucky 
but it's very appropriate for what I hear physicists talking about, which I don't understand at all, but anyway, this is of many worlds in this world. Just like unto a nest of boxes round, degrees of sizes within each box are found. So in this world may many worlds more be, thinner and less, and less still by degree. Although they are not subject to our sense, a world may be no bigger than two pence. Nature is curious, and such work may make that our dull sense can never find but scape. For creatures small as atoms may be there, if every atom a creature's figure bear. If for atoms a world can make, then see what several worlds might in an earring be. For millions of these atoms might be in the head of one small little single pin. And if thus small, then ladies may well wear a world of worlds as pendants in each ear. And uh, she was pretty interesting because um, in her autobiography, which I haven't read at all, but I read parts of it, she talks about how she was extremely bashful and she didn't like talking in front of crowds and uh, how she always liked to wear unique fashion. I, I don't know why, I, I don't remember if she says why, but I just think that's kind of funny. But um, I know I noticed among like those really smart 17th century people. Maybe this is just a random like confirmation bias thing, but in Thomas Brown's Religio Medici, he talks about how he's like extremely bashful and that sort of thing. And he lived at about about the same time as this Margaret Cavendish did. But I've been really interested in autobiographies lately, so. If anyone has any recommendations for good ones, I'm mostly interested in like um, physicists or mathematicians, but really any good autobiography I'm interested in. I found a couple that may interest people. Um, again, I don't know how to say his last name, but he's a French mathematician from the 20th century, Alexander Grothendieck. I don't know if that's how you say it, Grothendieck. But um, he started learning math during the Holocaust, like during World War I. He wasn't in the Holocaust, but he was in France at the time. But uh, he had a rough time of it. But he, that's when he learned, started learning math. And he became uh, like where he didn't have a state. He was stateless. And he eventually went over to uh, Vietnam during the Vietnam War and all this sort of interesting stuff. But... His, I don't think his autobiography is published, but it's online. It's some some people are translating it free online, and uh, it's pretty neat. I read a decent part of it, and then there's a couple I haven't read yet, but maybe of interest to people. But Mungo Park, he helped discover for the Europeans Africa in the like 1700s, and. Uh, he he was a really interesting guy. There are there's description of him going through the rivers in like Central Africa during in the Congo I think, being chased like he is in like one canoe and he's being chased by sixty canoes, and I just think that would be like terrifying, where all they had were guns and they were being chased by sixty canoes full of people trying to kill them. Um, those are free on Project Gutenberg. And then the one other really interesting one um, is uh, Hideki Yukawa, who was the first Japanese guy to win the Nobel Prize. And I found him by the, uh, there's an interview with Robert Oppenheimer, who's talking about the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And he talks about how Hideki Yukawa was, was one of the first um Japanese guys to be invited over to America after World War II to kind of like, you know, repair relations. But he has an autobiography called The Traveler. And uh, it's pretty expensive. 
I think it's like thirty dollars for two hundred page book, but it does seem very interesting. But uh, yeah, if anyone has any recommendations for good autobiographies, I'd appreciate it. Well, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Death is a gang boss.